Book 4, 55 B.C. German invasion of Gaul. The Romans crossed the Rhine. In the following winter, the one in which Pompey and Marcus Crassus entered upon their consulship, two German tribes, the Eusipides and the Tincteri, crossed the Rhine in large numbers at a point not far from its mouth. Their reason for making this move was because for the last few years they had been constantly attacked by the Suebi, and so prevented from cultivating their own land. The Suebi are much the largest and most warlike of all the German nations. They are said to consist of a hundred clans, from each of which they draw every year a thousand men to be used as warriors fighting outside their frontiers. The rest, who stay at home, support both the army and themselves, and in the following year take their turn at military service while the others stay at home. In this way their lands are cultivated without interruption, and they are also continually trained and practiced in war. They have no private ownership of land, and it is their rule not to settle down and stay in any one place for more than a year. They do not use grain much for food, but live chiefly on milk and meat and spend a lot of time in hunting. Their diet, regular exercise, and the fact that they are their own masters, for from their earliest years they are without any training in discipline or duty to others and never do anything contrary to their inclination, all this makes them men of great strength and enormous size. And though they live in an extremely cold climate, they make a practice of bathing in the rivers and of wearing nothing in the way of clothes except skins, which are so scanty that they leave a great part of the body naked. They allow traders into their country, but this is rather because they want to find purchasers for their booty than because they are particularly anxious to import anything from abroad. It is interesting to note that while the Gauls are extremely fond of horses and will pay huge prices for them, the Germans use no imported horses at all. Instead, they stick to their own breed of the animal. Small, ugly creatures, and by giving them regular training, make them remarkably tough and efficient. In cavalry engagements, they often jump from their horses and fight on foot the horses being trained to stand still, meanwhile, so that the warrior can remount quickly if need be. According to their way of thought, the use of a saddle is thoroughly disgraceful and effeminate. Consequently, however few they may be, they will confidently attack any body of saddled horsemen, however large. They allow no wine to be imported because they think that wine makes men soft and effeminate and incapable of enduring hardship. They think that the greatest glory a nation can have is to keep as broad a belt as possible of uninhabited land across their frontiers, since this, in their view, is an indication that great numbers of other states are unable to stand up to them in war. So, for example, it is said that on one side of the Suebic territory, one will find nearly 600 miles of country which is uninhabited. On another side, their nearest neighbors are the Ubii, who were once by German standards a large and prosperous nation. The Ubii are rather more civilized than the other German tribes. They live on the Rhine, are often visited by traders, and being so close to Gaul, have themselves been influenced by the Gallic way of life. The Suebi have made frequent attempts to drive them from their country by force of arms, but have found them too strong and too numerous to be able to do so. Nevertheless, they have forced the UBE to pay tribute, and made them much weaker and less important than they were before. The above-mentioned Eusipides and Tincteri were in the same position. They had stood up to attacks from the Suebi for many years, but in the end had been driven out of their country, had wandered about in various parts of Germany for three years, and had reached the Rhine. The point at which they reached the river was in the territory of the Manapi, who had lands, buildings, and villages on both banks. The Manapi had been alarmed at the approach of such a vast horde, had evacuated their settlements on the right bank, and had posted detachments of troops along the left to prevent the Germans from crossing. The Germans did everything they could to get across, but failed. 
They could not force a passage because they had no boats, and the Monopian patrols prevented them from getting across by stealth. They therefore pretended that they were going back again to their own home country, marched a three-day journey in that direction, and then turned back again toward the Rhine. The cavalry did the whole of the return journey in a single night, and caught the Monopi entirely off guard. Scouts had informed the Monopi of the German withdrawal, and they had crossed the Rhine again and returned to their own villages without any apprehension. They were now killed by the Germans, who then seized their ships and got across the Rhine before the other half of the Monopi on the left bank knew what was happening. The Germans seized all their buildings and lived on their supplies of food for the rest of the winter. When I received a report of these events, I was somewhat worried at the thought of the Gauls' instability. They are always making one plan after another, and in general always want to change the existing regime. In my view, it was impossible to rely on them at all. For example, it is a common habit of theirs to force travelers to stop, whether they like it or not, and question them on what rumors they have heard, or what facts they know about each and every subject of interest. And in the towns, crowds will gather round any trader who arrives, and compel him to say where he comes from, and what the news is there. It is often on the basis of information of this sort that they are induced to make quite important decisions, which immediately afterward they are bound to regret, since they are the slaves of baseless rumors, and most of those whom they question merely make up stories, which they think likely to please them. I was aware of these characteristics of theirs, and not wanting to have to face a still more serious campaign, I set out to join the army earlier than usual. On my arrival, I found that my suspicions had been justified. Some states had sent deputations to the Germans, inviting them to leave the Rhineland and promising to supply them with everything they needed. With this encouragement, the Germans were spreading over a wider area and had now reached the country of the Iburones and the Condrusi, who are dependents of the Treveri. I summoned a meeting of the Gallic chieftains, but considered it best not to tell them of what I knew. Instead, I merely spoke some reassuring words of encouragement, and told them to produce cavalry contingents for the campaign which I proposed to conduct against the Germans. After arranging for the food supply and choosing the cavalry I wanted, I began to march into the country where the Germans were reported to be. I was already within a few days' march of them when they sent a deputation to me with the following message. We Germans have no wish to begin a war with the Roman people, but we are perfectly prepared to fight if provoked, since it is an ancestral custom of ours to resist any attack that is made upon us, and never to refuse battle. We wish, however, to point out that we came to Gaul not by choice, but because we were driven out of our homes. If you Romans wish to earn our gratitude, you will find us good friends. Either give us land, or allow us to keep the land which we have won by conquest. We ourselves acknowledge no superiors except the Suebi, and not even the immortal gods are as strong as they are. But on earth there is no other people whom we cannot conquer. To all this I made what seemed to me a suitable reply. I concluded by saying that I could not retain friendly relations with them if they stayed in Gaul, that it was unreasonable to suppose that because they had failed to protect their own land, they were justified in seizing land that belonged to others, that in any case there was no land in Gaul that could be given to them without doing an injustice to others, especially considering their enormous numbers. I told them, however, that I should be quite willing for them to settle, if they wished to do so, in the country of the Ubii, whose representatives were in my camp, complaining of how they had been treated by the Suebi, and asking me for help, and I promised that I would give the necessary orders to the Ubii. The representatives who had been sent to me said that they would report back to their people, and, after my proposals had been discussed, would return to me in three days' time. Meanwhile, they asked me not to move my camp any nearer to them. I told them that I was unable to grant this request either. 
In fact, I knew that some days previously they had sent a large detachment of cavalry across the Meuse into the country of the Ambivariti to bring in plunder and supplies. And I thought their reasons for delaying matters was because they were waiting for this cavalry force to get back. The Meuse rises in the Vosges Mountains, in the country of the Lingones. Into it flows a tributary from the Rhine called the Val, and forms the island of the Batavi. The Meuse itself flows into the Rhine about seventy-five miles from the sea. The Rhine rises in the country of the Liponti, an alpine tribe. On its long, swift course, it flows through the territories of the Nantuates, Helveti, Sequani, Mediomatriques, Trivoki, and Trevery. As it nears the ocean, it splits into several streams, forming a number of large islands. Many of these are inhabited by fierce, savage tribes, some of whom are believed to live simply on fish and birds' eggs. The Rhine has many mouths through which it flows into the ocean. I was no more than twelve miles away from the enemy when their representatives returned to me as had been agreed. They met me when we were actually on the march, and earnestly begged me not to advance any further. I refused this request, and they then asked me to send word to the cavalry at the head of our column, telling them not to engage in battle. They also asked me to give them a chance of sending a deputation to the Ubii, and declared that they would accept my suggestion of settling there, provided that the chiefs and council of the Ubii would give them sworn guarantees. They wanted me to allow them three days for completing these arrangements. I regarded all this as a mere pretext with the same object as before, namely to secure an interval of three days in which time their cavalry detachment could get back again. However, I told them that, on that day, I would only go four miles further, as I should have to do to get water. I asked them to meet me at this point on the following day with as many of their tribesmen as possible, so that I might hear exactly what their proposals were. Meanwhile, I sent instructions to the officers in command of the cavalry, the whole cavalry force was in the vanguard, telling them not to attack the enemy, and, if attacked themselves, to hold on until I arrived with the main army. Our cavalry numbered five thousand, while the enemy had no more than eight hundred, since the force that had crossed the Meuse to get provisions had not yet returned. Nevertheless, as soon as our cavalry came into sight, the enemy attacked them. Our men, who imagined that they had nothing to fear, since the enemy deputation had only just left me and had begged a truce for that day, were quickly thrown into confusion. When they turned and tried to make a stand, the Germans, following their usual practice, jumped down and unseated a number of our men by stabbing their horses in the belly. They put the rest to flight, driving them on in such a state of panic that they did not stop until they came in sight of our army on the march. Seventy-four of our cavalry were killed in this action, including Piso, a very gallant Aquitanian. He came from a most distinguished family. His grandfather had been king of his tribe and had received from our senate the title friend. When his brother was surrounded by the enemy, Piso succeeded in rescuing him, but his own horse was wounded and he was thrown. He fought back most gallantly as long as he could, but he was surrounded on all sides and fell after receiving a number of wounds. His brother, who had escaped from the fighting and was some way off, saw him fall. He put spurs to his horse, rode straight at the enemy, and was killed. After this battle I realized that I was dealing with an enemy who was capable of treacherously launching an unprovoked attack just after they had asked for peace. There seemed no good reason for receiving any more deputations from them or accepting any proposals they might make. I considered, too, that it would be folly to wait for their cavalry to return and their forces to be increased. Knowing, as I did, the instability of the Gallic character, I was aware that the enemy had already made a great impression on them by this one battle. I concluded that I must allow the enemy no time for making further plans, and having reached this decision, informed the senior officers of my staff 
that I propose to bring the enemy to battle without wasting a single day. We then had a great stroke of luck. Early next morning, a large party of Germans, including all their chieftains and the elders of the tribes, came to visit me at our camp. They were following their usual methods of treachery and deceit, for, though they claimed to have come in order to make excuses for their action on the previous day, when they had broken the agreement they themselves had asked for by launching an attack on us, they aimed to at deceiving me so that I would grant them an extension of the truce. I was delighted to find them in my power, and ordered them to be kept under arrest. I then led a whole army out of the camp, with the cavalry bringing up the rear, since I thought its morale had been shaken by its recent defeat. Marching in three parallel columns, we advanced for eight miles and covered the distance so quickly that we reached the German camp before the Germans could have any idea of what was happening. What with the speed of our advance and the absence of their own leaders, everything filled them with a sudden panic. They had no time to think or to prepare for battle, and were too confused to be able to decide whether it was best to march out against us, defend the camp, or run for their lives. Their terror was quite obvious from the way in which they were running about and shouting, and our men, furious about the treachery of the previous day, burst into their camp. Here yeah, those of them who could get hold of their arms quickly stood up to us for a short time, fighting among their carts and baggage wagons. However, there remained a great crowd of women and children, since the Germans had brought everything they had with them when they crossed the Rhine. These now began to flee in all directions, and I sent the cavalry after them to hunt them down. The Germans heard the noise of shouting behind their backs, and could see how their own people were being slaughtered. They threw away their arms, abandoned their standards, and came rushing out of the camp. When they reached the confluence of the Moselle and the Rhine, they saw that there was no hope of escaping further. Great numbers were killed, and the rest hurled themselves into the river and perished there, overcome by panic, exhaustion, and the force of the current. Our men returned to camp without a single fatal casualty, and only a very few wounded. We were relieved from the fear of what might have been a most arduous campaign, for the enemy had numbered 430,000. As for the Germans held under arrest in our camp, I gave them permission to leave, but they were terrified of being killed or tortured by the Gauls, whose land they had devastated, and said that they would prefer to stay with me. I allowed them to retain their liberty. Now that this German war was over, I decided that it would be a good thing for many reasons to cross the Rhine. My chief reason was that I wanted the Germans, who, as I saw, were only too ready to cross over into Gaul, to begin to have some worries of their own, as they would when they realized that a Roman army had both the daring and the ability to make the crossing. I was also concerned about the cavalry detachment of the Eusipites and the Tencteri, which, as already mentioned, had crossed the mews to bring in plunder and grain, and had taken no part in the battle. After the rout of their people, they had retired across the Rhine into the country of the Sugambri, and had joined forces with them. I had sent messengers to the Sugambri to demand the surrender of all those who had made war against me and against Gaul. They had replied that the Rhine marked the boundary of Roman sovereignty. If, they said, I thought that the Germans had no right to cross into Gaul without my permission, then how could I claim to exercise any power or authority on the German side of the river? Finally, there was the question of the Ubii, the only tribe across the Rhine which had sent representatives to me, entered into a friendly alliance, and given hostages. The Ubi were now asking me most urgently to come to their help against the Suebi, who were exercising severe pressure on them. They said that if concerns of state made this impossible, it would be enough for me to bring my army to the other side of the Rhine. This in itself would be sufficient help to them, and would give them sufficient confidence for the future. 
according to them, the effect of the defeat of Ariovistus and of this latest victory of ours, had been such that our army was known and feared even among the remotest peoples of Germany. Merely to have it known that they enjoyed our friendship would be enough to keep them safe. They promised to provide large numbers of boats for transporting the army across the river. These were the reasons which made me decide to cross the Rhine. But I came to the conclusion that to make the crossing by means of boats would involve too many risks and would be a less impressive achievement than what was demanded for my own prestige and that of the Roman people. It was true that because of the breadth and depth of the river and the swiftness of the current, there were very great difficulties in the way of building a bridge. Nevertheless, I felt that this was what I must try to do, or else not take the army across at all. We therefore began to construct our bridge on the following plan. Two piles, eighteen inches thick, slightly pointed at the lower ends, and of lengths varying in accordance with the depth of the river, were fastened together two feet apart. They were then lowered into the river from rafts, fixed firmly in the riverbed, and driven home with pile drivers. Instead of being driven in vertically, as piles usually are, they were fixed obliquely, leaning in the direction of the current. Opposite these, again, and forty feet downstream, another pair of piles was fixed and coupled together in the same way, though this time they slanted forward against the force of the current. The two pairs of piles were then joined by a beam, two feet wide, the ends of which fitted exactly into the spaces between the two piles of each pair. The pairs were kept apart from each other by braces which secured each pile to the end of the crossbeam. The piles were thus both held apart and, in a different sense, clamped together. The whole structure was strong and so adapted to the forces of nature that the greater the strength of the current, the more tightly locked were the timbers. A series of these trestles was pushed across the river. They were connected with each other by timbers set at right angles on top of which were laid poles and bundles of sticks. Moreover, an extra set of piles was fixed obliquely on the downstream side of the bridge. These were connected with the main structure and acted as buttresses to take the force of the stream. Other piles were fixed vertically in the riverbed a little way upstream from the bridge, so that if the natives attempted to destroy it by floating tree trunks or ships down the river, this row of barriers would lessen their force and save the bridge from being damaged. Ten days after we had started to collect the timber, the whole work had been finished, and the army led across. I left a strong guard at each end of the bridge and then marched into the country of the Sugambri. Meanwhile, deputations arrived from several states, asking for peace and friendship. I replied courteously to these deputations and told them to have hostages sent to me. As to the Sugambri, they had been preparing for flight ever since the moment we started to build the bridge. They had been advised to follow this course by the Tencteri and the Eusipites, who were with them, and so had evacuated their territory, and, taking all their property with them, had disappeared into the uninhabited forests. I spent a few days in their country, burning all their villages and buildings, and cutting down their crops. Then we moved into the country of the Ubii. After I had promised to help them in the event of their being attacked by the Suebi, I received from them the following information. As soon as the Suebi had been told by their scouts that we were building a bridge, they had, as is their usual custom when threatened, summoned a national council and sent messengers to all parts of their country, ordering everyone to leave the towns and to take their women, children, and property to safe places within the forests. Meanwhile, all who were of military age were to assemble in one place, a place which was, according to the Ubi, in about the middle of the country occupied by the Suebi. It was here that they had decided to fight us, and here they were waiting for us to arrive. 
At the time I received this information, I had already accomplished all the objects that had made me decide to lead the army across the Rhine. The Germans had been intimidated, the Sugambri punished, and the Ubi relieved from the pressure exercised on them by the Suebi. Altogether, we had spent eighteen days across the Rhine, and had done, I thought, all that honor or interest required. We therefore withdrew to Gaul, breaking up the bridge behind us. The First Invasion of Britain Not much of the summer was now left, and winter sets in early in these regions, because all this side of Gaul faces north. Nevertheless, I went ahead with plans for an expedition to Britain. I knew that in nearly all of our campaigns in Gaul, help had come to the enemy from Britain. Even if we should have too short a time this season for conducting a full campaign, it seemed to me that it would be well worthwhile merely to have visited the island, to have seen what sort of people the inhabitants were, and to have gained some knowledge of the country, its harbors, and facilities for landing. The Gauls knew next to nothing of these things, since no one as a rule goes to Britain at all except traders, and these traders are themselves only acquainted with the seacoast and coastal regions directly opposite Gaul. So, though I made inquiries of all the traders I could find, I could get no information concerning the size of the island, the names and populations of the tribes inhabiting it, their methods of warfare, their system of government, or the harbors that could accommodate a large fleet of big ships. I naturally wanted to be informed on all these subjects before venturing on the expedition, and so I sent Gaius Volusinus in advance with a warship, thinking him the best man available for the job. He was ordered to make all the necessary inquiries, and then come back to me as soon as he could. I myself, with the whole army, started for the country of the Morini, from which there is the shortest crossing to Britain. Here I ordered all the ships to assemble from the neighboring districts, together with the fleet which I had built last summer for the Venetian campaign. Meanwhile, my plans had become known. Traders had carried the news across to the Britons, and from several British states, deputations came to me with promises to give hostages and to submit to the authority of Rome. I heard what they had to say, promised to give the most favorable consideration to their requests, and urged them on their side to keep their word. When I sent them back home, I sent Comius with them. It was Comius whom I had myself made king of the Atrebates after I had subdued that tribe. I had a high opinion of his courage and of his good sense. I believed that he was loyal to me, and it was said that he had much influence in Britain. I told him to visit as many states as he could, to urge them to seek Roman protection, and to inform them that I myself would soon be among them. Volusinus carried out as full a reconnaissance of the coast as was possible, considering the fact that he did not venture to disembark and put himself in the power of the natives. Five days later he returned to me and gave me his report. While I was in this part of the country waiting for the ships to be got ready, deputations came to me from a large section of the Morini in order to apologize for their policy of last year. It was, they said, only because of their lack of civilization and their ignorance of our ways that they had made war on Rome, and they promised that in the future they would carry out any orders I might give them. All this, I thought, had happened most fortunately for me. I had no wish to leave an enemy in my rear. Yet there was not time this year to carry out a full campaign, and in any case, I thought that the expedition to Britain was much more important than the settlement of these rather trivial matters. So I ordered the Morini to produce a large number of hostages, and when these had been delivered, I accepted the submission of the tribe. By now we had secured about eighty transports and had them concentrated at one point. This was enough, in my opinion, to carry across two legions— 
There were also a number of warships which I entrusted to the Quaestor, the generals, and the commanders of auxiliary troops. In addition to these ships, we had eighteen transports which were prevented by contrary winds from reaching the same harbour as the rest. They were eight miles further along the coast, and I allotted them to the cavalry. I handed over the rest of the army to the generals Quintus Titurius Sabinus and Lucius Arunculius Cotta, with orders to march against the Monopi and against those clans of the Morini which had not sent deputations to me. Another general, Publius Sulpicius Rufus, was ordered to guard the harbour, and was given a force which I considered large enough for this job. When all these arrangements had been made, we found the weather favourable for sailing, and put to sea about midnight. The cavalry had been ordered to proceed to the northern port, embark, and follow after us. However, they were rather too slow about doing this, and failed to catch the tide. I myself, with the leading ships, reached Britain about 9 a.m. We could see the enemy's armed forces lined up all along the cliffs. At this point there was a narrow beach with high hills behind it, so that it was impossible to hurl weapons down from the higher ground onto the shore. It seemed to me an extremely bad place to effect a landing, and so we waited at anchor until about 3.30 p.m. for the rest of the ships to join us. During this time I summoned the generals and high-ranking officers, informed them of what I had learned from Volusinus, and told them what I wanted done. I warned them that the tactical demands of warfare in general, and especially so on sea, where things can happen quickly and unpredictably, require that orders must be carried out instantly and on the spot. The meeting was then dismissed. We had both the wind and the tide in our favour. The signal was given to weigh anchor, and, after moving on about eight miles, we ran the ships ashore on an open, evenly shelved beach. The natives, however, had realized what we planned to do. They had sent their cavalry and their chariots, a type of weapon which they nearly always use in battle, on ahead. The rest of their troops followed behind, and they now stood ready to oppose our landing. Things were very difficult for us indeed, and for the following reasons. Our ships were too big to be run ashore except where the water was deep. The troops knew nothing of the ground on which they were to fight, and not only had their hands full, but were weighed down by the heavy armor which they carried. They had to jump down from the transports, get a footing in the surf, and fight the enemy all at the same time. The enemy, on the other hand, were quite unencumbered, and knew the ground well. Either standing on dry land, or going a little way into the water, they hurled their weapons boldly at us, and spurred on their horses, which were trained for this sort of fighting. All this had a most disturbing effect on our men. They had no experience at all of this sort of warfare, and they failed to show the fire and enthusiasm which could always be expected of them in battles on land. When I saw what the situation was, I ordered the warships, which were swifter and easier to handle than the transports, and at the same time were of a shape which the natives had scarcely ever seen before, to move clear of the transports, to row forward at full speed, and then run ashore on the enemy's exposed flank. From this position they were to make use of slings, arrows, and artillery to drive the enemy back and clear the beach. This maneuver proved to be extremely useful to us. The natives were greatly disturbed by the shape of the ships, the moving of the oars, and the strange machines used as artillery. They came to a halt, and then fell back, though only a little way. Then, as our men still hesitated, chiefly because of the depth of the water, the man who carried the eagle of the Tenth Legion, after praying to the gods that what he was going to do would bring good luck to the legion, shouted out in a loud voice, Come on, men, jump, unless you want to lose your eagle to the enemy. I, in any case, will do my duty to my country and to my general. He then threw himself from the ship, and began to go toward the enemy, carrying the eagle with him. 
He was followed by all the rest, who jumped into the sea together, shouting out to each other that they must not disgrace themselves by losing their eagle. When the men from the next ships saw them, they followed their example and also began to move toward the enemy. Now both sides fought fiercely. Among our men, however, there was considerable disorder, since it was impossible for them to keep ranks, stand firmly in place, or follow proper standards. In fact, as they came to land from the ships, each man attached himself to the first standard he came across. The enemy knew all the shallows, and when they saw from the beach any party of our men disembarking one by one from a ship, they spurred their horses into the water and attacked while we were at a disadvantage, and they could swarm around a few of us at a time in superior numbers, and others, meanwhile, hurled their weapons at the exposed flank of whole units which had formed up together. Seeing what was going on, I had troops put aboard the warship's boats and the small craft used for reconnaissance, and sent these up in support wherever I saw that our men were in difficulty. As soon as our forces had gained a firm footing on shore, and their comrades had formed up behind them, they charged and put the enemy to flight. However, they could not pursue them for any distance, because the cavalry transports had been unable to hold course and reach the island. This was the one thing that prevented me from enjoying my usual good luck. When the defeated enemy had reformed after the rout, they lost no time in sending a deputation to me, asking for peace and promising to give hostages and obey any orders I might give them. With this deputation came Comius the Atrobation, whom, as mentioned above, I had sent on ahead to Britain. When he had disembarked from his ship and had begun to give my message to the Britons in the capacity of an official envoy, the natives had seized and chained him. Now, after the battle, they sent him back, and in asking for peace, laid the blame for what had been done on the common people, and begged me to forgive them on the grounds of ignorance. I told them that I took a serious view of their action in launching an unprovoked attack against us after they themselves had sent envoys to the continent to ask me for peace. Nevertheless, I said, I would forgive their ignorance, and I ordered them to deliver hostages. Some of these hostages were handed over at once. The rest, they said, would have to be fetched from a distance, and they promised to produce them in a few days' time. Meanwhile, they ordered their men to get back to work on the land, and chieftains began to come in from all parts of the country in order to put themselves and their tribes under my protection. In this way, peace was established. Four days after our arrival in Britain, the eighteen ships, which, as already mentioned, had taken the cavalry aboard, set sail with a gentle breeze behind them from the northern port. But as they approached the shores of Britain and could be seen from our camp, suddenly such a violent storm arose that none of them could hold course. Some were carried back to the harbour from which they had set out, Others, at great peril to themselves, were swept southward toward the westerly part of the island. In spite of the danger, they dropped anchor, but began to ship so much water that they were forced to put out to sea again in the darkness and make for the continent. That night there happened to be a full moon. Though we were unaware of the fact, it is at this period of the month that one gets the highest tides in the Atlantic. So it happened that the warships used for the crossing, which had been dragged up on the beach, became waterlogged, and the transports, which were riding at anchor, were badly knocked about by the storm. It was impossible for our men to handle them or do anything to help. A number of ships broke up. The rest, after losing cables, anchors, and rigging, were rendered useless. The whole army, naturally enough, was filled with consternation. There were no other ships in which to make the return voyage, and we had with us none of the necessary materials for refitting. It had been generally assumed, too, that we were going to spend the winter in Gaul, and so no arrangements had been made for bringing grain supplies to Britain for the winter. The British chieftains who had assembled at my headquarters after the battle saw our predicament and began to hatch plots together. They knew that we were without cavalry, grain, and ships, 
and they saw how few we were in number from the small size of our camp, which was all the smaller because I had brought the legions across without their heavy equipment. They therefore decided that the best thing to do was to renew hostilities, cut us off from grain and other supplies, and prolong the campaign into the winter. They felt sure that if we were either conquered in war or cut off from returning, no one in the future would attempt another invasion of Britain. So they once again exchanged oaths of loyalty, began to slip away one by one from our camp, and secretly called up again their men who had returned to work on the land. I had not yet learned what their plans were. All the same, from what had happened to our ships, and from the fact that the natives had stopped bringing in hostages, I had a suspicion that things would turn out as, in fact, they did. I therefore tried to be ready to meet any situation that might arise. Grain was brought into camp every day from the countryside. Timber and bronze from the most seriously damaged ships were used to repair the rest, and other materials for such work were ordered to be brought from the continent. The soldiers worked magnificently, and though twelve ships were lost, we were able to make all the others tolerably seaworthy. While this was going on, one legion had been sent out as usual to bring in grain. On this particular day it was the seventh legion. Up to this time we had no reason to suspect that the enemy would renew hostilities, since many of them were still working in the fields, and others actually used to visit us quite frequently in the camp. But now the guards on duty at the camp gates reported to me that an unusually large cloud of dust could be seen in the direction in which the legion had gone. I guessed what had happened, though the natives had made some surprise move against us, and ordered the cohorts on guard duty to set out with me. Two other cohorts were detailed to take their place on guard, and all the rest were instructed to arm and follow us at once. When we had gone forward some way from the camp, I could see that our men were up against severe enemy pressure, and were only just managing to hold out. The legion was crowded close together and under fire from every side. What had happened was this. Since the grain in this area had all been cut except for what was in one place, the enemy had assumed that this was where our men would go, and had hidden in the woods during the night. Then, when our men, their arms laid aside, were scattered and busy reaping, they suddenly burst out on them, killed a few, and threw the rest into confusion before they could form up in proper order, swarming around them with cavalry and chariots. The tactics employed by these charioteers are as follows. First, they drive in every direction, hurling their javelins. Very often the sheer terror inspired by the galloping horses and the noise of the wheels throws their opponents into a state of confusion. Then they make their way through the squadrons of their own cavalry, leap down from the chariots, and fight on foot. Meanwhile the drivers retire a little from the battle and halt the chariots in a suitable position, so that if those who are now fighting on foot are hard-pressed by the enemy— they will have an easy means of retreating to their own lines. So, in their battles, they combine the mobility of cavalry with the stamina of infantry. Daily training and practice have brought them to a remarkable state of efficiency. They are able, for example, to control their horses at full gallop on the steepest slopes, to pull them up and turn them in a moment, to turn along the pole, stand on the yoke, and dart back again into the chariot. Our men were quite unnerved by this kind of fighting, which was so unfamiliar to them, and I came to their rescue just in time. For the enemy halted when they saw us coming, and our men recovered from their terror. However, once this result had been achieved, I decided that this was not the time for provoking battle and joining in a general engagement. I therefore stayed where I was, and after a short interval led the legions back to camp. All this kept the whole of our army fully occupied, and during this time the remaining natives who had been working in the fields made off and disappeared. 
There followed several days of continuous bad weather, which kept our men in camp and also prevented the enemy from attacking us. But during these days, the natives sent out messengers all over the country. These messengers told the people that we had only a small number of troops, and pointed out that there was now an excellent opportunity not only of getting plunder, but of securing their freedom for all time, if they could once drive us out of our camp. In this way they soon assembled a large force of infantry and cavalry, and marched up to our fortifications. I realized that the result was likely to be what it had been before, that even if we defeated them, they would be able to use their speed to get away safely. However, I now had about thirty cavalrymen brought over by Comius, the attribution mentioned above, so I drew the legions up in line in front of the camp. Battle was joined. The enemy, unable to stand up to our attack for long, turned and fled. We pursued them on foot as far as we had strength to do so, and killed quite a number. Then we set on fire all the buildings in the neighborhood and returned to camp. And that same day the enemy sent a deputation to ask for peace. I told them that they must deliver twice the number of hostages as before, and that these must be sent to the continent. This was because the equinox was close at hand, and, with the ships damaged as they were, I did not think it right to risk sailing in wintry weather. So, with a favorable wind to help us, we set sail soon after midnight, and reached the continent safely with the whole fleet. Two of the transports, however, were unable to make the same harbor as the rest, and were carried a little farther south. About three hundred troops disembarked from these ships and began to march toward our camp. Some of the Morini, the tribe whom I had left in a state of peace when I started for Britain, thinking they saw a chance of plunder, surrounded our men, at first in not very large numbers, and told them to lay down their arms if they did not want to be killed. Our men formed into a square and defended themselves, but soon they were encircled by about six thousand natives who had been attracted by the noise of shouting. When I heard what was happening, I sent all our cavalry out of camp to go to their relief. Meanwhile, our men held out, fighting with the utmost bravery, for more than four hours. They killed many of the enemy, and themselves sustained a few wounds. As soon as our cavalry came into sight, the enemy threw away their arms and fled. We killed a great number of them. Next day I sent Titus Labienus with the legions that had returned from Britain against the Morini, who had thus reopened hostilities against us. The marshes to which they had retreated in the previous year were now dried up, and they had nowhere to take refuge. Consequently, almost all surrendered to Labienus. Quintus Titurius and Lucius Cotta had led their legions into the country of the Monopi, but they found that the enemy had gone into hiding in an area of dense forests. So they returned to headquarters after having laid waste all the enemy's fields, cut down their crops, and burned their buildings. I arranged for all the legions to camp for the winter in the country of the Belgi. Only two of the British tribes sent the hostages I had demanded. The rest failed to do so. On receiving my dispatches with an account of these achievements, the Senate decreed a public thanksgiving of twenty days.